you people are doing in Italy, you're doing about eight times as much as we did. In France, you're doing, it's, it's, it's much more intense. All I can say is, good luck. <laughs> singing was the, I felt closest to the group than I did at any other time, and it was definitely a real, I always felt totally uplifted, um, more so, I mean, just completely more so than I had when I when we were singing here, I mean, it just made that music come alive, um, I mean, just walking into those cathedrals, I mean, just was an uplift for me. And then singing and being able to sing uh, was just really such a high feeling. And uh, I don't think, well, I mean, I wouldn't have ever been able to last it through it if it wasn't for that. I mean, those were the times that I was the most, most happiest and most together. I mean, I just was, wasn't thinking of anything else, you know, and I could just totally lose my mind of any kind of thoughts except for just just singing and just feeling really neat. It was all very, very spiritual uh, experience. One doesn't need to be religious to appreciate a thousand-year-old building or 500-year-old music. I was brought up hating the church, especially the church, especially the Catholic Church in France, which is where we say, because my mother is French, she hates them. Um, it had a real, it was weird, it was, it was paradoxical for me, coming from my background, to go sing this music. I thought it was real funny how none of us believed any of it, and we would sing it anyway, and we would love it, and smile, and laugh, and and the music is, you know, is very beautiful, and that we could appreciate it on that level. That, that's what interested me the most, and that's what, what made, that's what I learned a lot about on the trip, is that you don't have to believe in the Bible to love um, religious things. Very nice. The humming was so nice. Did it? Um, I, I enjoyed it a whole lot, actually, more than more than usual. Because um, it was short and it was it was very pretty. I thought the tenors did well. And, uh, 
gotcha. It was, it was all around pretty nice. <laughs> oh, I really liked it. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's really nice. It's the first time since when? I don't know. It's been, also, pretty, it's been pretty boring. For John was smiling, which was really nice. He was smiling and he was happy. Very good. It was a lot better. You should know. Huh? You should, you should yeah. know. You were listening to it. Really? <laughs> hey, Rob. What I thought of it? It went pretty well, I'd say. Except there were times when I was singing and didn't know if I was singing. I just had my mouth open and couldn't tell if anything was coming out. <laughs> and other people have expressed the same thing. <laughs> Any other questions? No, that's good. Okay. How about you? Uh, no. No. <laughs> Lori, will you tell me how you, what you thought of it? You just hold the mic and tell me what you thought of it. Of the performance? Yeah. I thought the performance was, was fairly good, considering that we were all pretty tired and that we didn't feel so good. And I think that it, it's had some of the finesse that it lacks a lot of the time. You know, when we have a high energy, but we, we don't seem to take, be as precise with it. I thought it sounded pretty nice. <laughs> to be precisely in time from now on, because I just hate people who don't like people who don't like the people. You know, I hate the people who hate the people, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I just hate that we, we do not follow the schedule. I would like you to ask to be in time. We will be in time. Well, the pace of the trip was, was rapid and intense as hell. You know, the, it wasn't hard to handle though, as far as, it wasn't difficult to handle because it, it was what I had expected and what I wanted, you know, it was, I, I, there was a definite time limit and I wanted to get as much out of it as possible, so the pace of the trip for me was great. I think the scheduling of the time was not done well, I think it was far too intense, I don't think anybody got out of it as much as they could have. Um, I think that uh, things were done like, I mean, you just got satiated in certain, in the areas, you know, that we were studying at the time, like we do art history and it would just be like art history, you know, for six hours or wine tasting until you were smashed, you know, it, you couldn't, it was too hard to um, really absorb it all, it was just too intense in a lot of ways, but it was really great too, I mean, it, considering the amount of time we had. There was no other way uh, we could have gotten in that much, and, and so I'm glad of that. At the time, I was a little worse for wear, but... Yes, to explain it about the tradition, uh, we are here in a very old traditional family business. Society only since one century, about that, uh, in 1867, but uh, totally family society, yes. That's only for care, you know. And before we were private, Vintners, since 1580, Negisem, from father to the son. Before 1580, we don't know, because all the village was destroyed by the Sweden in the 30 years war. war. Right. Excuse my English no. if it's not perfect, oh, but... <laughs> Now, uh, we stay and we like to follow in this family business and traditional business. Uh, why? Because the house Leon Bay uh, is today uh, the house which tries to keep and to follow and to push the quality. We are from far not the cheapest, often by the most expensive wine in Alsace, but we deliver only wine in France to the higher restaurants and hotels. I think each of us we will, will spread that sense of quality around majority. wherever we go. We're going to carry with us. It's a very, very small town. And there's something that the is lacking in the United States, the, the idea of, of uh, a family operation making now, uh, vinegar or something for 350 nice years is something that's you know, totally foreign you know, to the well, Americans. And I it's think the, uh, everywhere we go throughout our lives in America, that we will spread the idea and make it understandable to people who've never experienced it. One sort of grape and gives one wine, Burgundy. 
Bordeaux, they have two or three sort of grapes, they mix together. It gives one wine, the Bordeaux wine. But Alsace produces Silvana, Riesling, Gewürztraminer, Tokay, which is a Pinot Gris, and other sorts. And each grape sort gives one wine. They are never blended together. It gives only one more common wine sold in little bottles, which is a carafe wine, which name is Edelzwicker, right. and that's a blend. We build in Alsace the wine totally like the French, Burgundy, Bordeaux, even We met so much quality, it was, uh, it was dry, ast I, I was astounded. Very wine. I don't think wine. there were, there were maybe two all or three places that, that we went to um, that, that I felt there was anything less than and really being impeccable um, in terms of, of the, uh, the dedication of the people who were either making wine or preparing food or um, you know, taking care of their, their church or whatever, you know, having that kind of respect for whatever they were doing. And that was, that was really nice. <laughs> Debbie, what do you think of these wine tests? I think they're great. I yeah. enjoy it. Why? Well, I don't know. It's kind of, it's, I like trying to distinguish, I don't know that much about wines, but it's nice trying to associate, like, oh, yeah, that is cinnamon. Yeah, it smells like tar. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the differences. I like that. How do these wines compare to the ones you have in the States? Absolutely beyond comparison. <laughs> I mean, you know, from this to Boone's Farm is a pretty long trek. <laughs> It's not really a compromise. I'd say it's more of a an integration. It doesn't it doesn't say, well, we'll take so and so piece of uh, Christian faith and we'll take so and so piece of classical reason and leave the rest, you know, and just put these two together. It takes all of Christian faith and all of classical reason and brings them together or attempts to bring them together into one consistent system. Um, so that's essentially what scholasticism is. Uh, in Gothic architecture, well, you can see sort of these same trends or, or analogous trends that were not present before. Like in Romanesque architecture, it's mainly the whole idea is a copy of. Go ahead. Well, you think about scholasticism? Were they trying to, to justify through? through rational reasoning, uh, the basis of Christianity, like uh, transubstantiation and things like that? Well, there were certain, yeah, I was going to get into this later, but it's all right. I liked it. I mean, I, I liked listening to other people when they had good presentations, uh, more than I liked listening to Jennifer when she had equally good presentations, you know, partly because of the other people and partly just for a variety. Well, you know, the <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he he used reason for three things. First of all, reason can explain everything except the things that are revealed through divine <coughs> revelation. Talking about the fact that the facade of Notre Dame. Yesterday we decided that it was done in 1200. That it was done later due to the fact that it was such a rational facade and it corresponded to the interior. So if that is the hallmark of, of a cathedral, which is like, you know, a Gothic cathedral, then how do you explain the fact that there are any portals here? Side portals. To accommodate the towers. What? To accommodate the towers. Okay, to accommodate the towers. And what do we decide about the towers? That the, this is the north, by the way, and that's the north portal. That's the north transept over there, and that's the south, okay? Yeah. Um, okay, so the north tower is what? Later. Right. Yeah. And the south tower. Okay. okay. What have you decided? Let's let's use the sculpture a little bit. I hated it. I think that that a lot of people did like encyclopedia reports. You know, when we got to cathedrals, they would describe every single little thing. There wasn't enough emphasis. I I find that it could have been a good thing if 
the art historian had emphasized that ideas behind architecture, behind painting and things like that, are the things that through teaching people remember. None of us, hardly none of us had taught any classes or anything before, so we don't know what people remember and what people forget. I'm learning more and more. You know that people, it's best to deal with ideas. And I think that I dealt with ideas in mine, and I think that that was good. And some people dealt with ideas in theirs, and I understood a lot more. And it tied it together with history and with my interpretations. History, I didn't learn very much from the other people. The oils reflecting the porticos for the, for okay, the aisles in the, in the transept. Yeah, exactly. Very good. So well, what conclusion would you come to concerning the portals? They were built later. Which portals were built later? The, the ones over there. The north and the south no. transept portals were built later. Okay, so, I mean, we'll get into that a little bit later, but already we've got some clue, right, that there's something wrong with the facade of the church, that this, church, this facade was probably earlier. Yeah. Now, we know that it was probably earlier, not only because of the sculptural style, but because of the fact that this facade of the church doesn't correspond with the interior of the church. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dont je parle, les habitudes et les coutumes alimentaires dont je parlais tout à l'heure sont mémorisées chez l'adulte avec ces, euh, ces messages gustatifs. Vous allez aimer un aliment ou vous n'allez pas l'aimer. Et je reviendrai sur cette notion de préférence et d'habitude alimentaire. Donc, en fonction de ce que votre goût aura ressenti, vous aimerez cet aliment ou au contraire, vous aurez, vous le détesterez. And this is what creates Alimentary. alimentary habits, you understand alimentary habits, customs, because when you are used to taste a few things, then you like it or you don't like it, and, and you know that you like it and you don't like it, and, and that's the way you create habits, and in fact, tasting can be educated. It's not, it's if, if you never taste anything, you will never be a taster. For sure, it's evident, but you know. And if you, you are trained to taste things, then you memorize uh, all, all the informations you get, and then you are able to go on and, and to make differences. We definitely deserve 20 academic credits. Now, whether they should come under the headings that they did is a different question. Uh, but I don't think any college would give uh, credit for the courses I would describe those credits as falling in. <laughs> Introduction to travel, intermediate travel and advanced travel. <laughs> um, perhaps, maybe, for some of us, me anyway, a, a good comprehensive course in uh, hedonism, um, slightly, uh, and uh, sort of a course in, in cultural awareness, a uh, becoming, becoming conscious that there are other people in the world and that they don't all think like you and they don't even speak the same language as you. As you grow up, your tasting ability, your tasting level varies. And that's why when you are young, there are things you may like or dislike and then love later on. Because the, the level change. After being here at Antioch on campus, um, three or four quarters studying, um, depending on the kind of courses that you take here, I think that it was just as valid an academic experience as anything, almost anything else you can get here with certain exceptions, of course, but you can, any student can make out a program for a quarter, 20 credits on this campus and do much less work than we did and learn much less and study much less uh, and still get the credits than we did in Europe. Um, it's the same thing with any course, with any, with any uh, academic experience. It was individual. No, 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 no. 
just to explain them how, how to taste it, how it makes it similar to something they like or they dislike, or how it goes with, with you know, this type of thing. À ce sujet, je vais vous raconter une, une, une expérience. I think that I learned about five credits worth of art um, and about eight and a half credits worth of music and about half a credit worth of, of wine appreciation and all the rest and more I could bundle into dealing with people because that and and learning about about culture because that was that for me was you know what I did most of the time was uh, kind of stood there amazed at, at everything I had taken for granted about American culture um, and found that it was so most of it was so unique to the United States um, and lear learning all that stuff for me was the most educational part. Let's say normal, regular hours. They were having breakfast in the morning at 30, then 12, then some little thing at 4.30, and then the meal, night meal at 6.30. The Renaissance has been going on in Italy for uh, over a hundred years, and um, I mean his bodies are they're anatomically, you know, correct. I mean they're much more advanced than the earlier stuff we saw. They're proportional, but um, very stylized. And Adam's wrists, um, they're just kind of fat. They're plastic looking. Yeah, they're done with they're, such a precision. They're such hard precision. Lines yeah. that, that, that it's. Um, this is very much the chronic style. Uh, his, the, the women have a cat, cat eyes, very stylized, um, very nymph-like. I mean, the, the way people approach the art project was so very. People, Elizabeth, for example, dealt with the person, the spectator, perceiving the art rather than what came, what the historical of what made the art. For me, that was the important thing: is how to perceive the art. Because to me, that was what the whole trip was, was how to perceive, how to learn to perceive things, or educating your senses. It worked pretty well, depending on, you know, how well the student prepared. Some of the reports were really terrible, because the students just, I don't know, hadn't, either hadn't learned much or didn't know how to present it well. But on the other hand, I think it's really, it was a real good way to involve everybody and to learn, to be able to learn the stuff. Cause it, it's hard to teach art history to people who've had nothing at all. Everybody was sort of a specialist in their own field. I think it, I think it made people feel really good too to arrive in a town and, you know, there's your person that you'd studied all summer, and you can just tell the whole group of that. You, f you really feel like you knew something. It's laid out flat. Yeah. But What's I've that? Been, I mean, this is a lot of Italian influence in, in the fact that these, these yeah, are news that, that are being depicted here. But it's just, I want you to see Self-teaching was great if you could walk away from all the art projects and learn about the thing as we were there, but self-teaching in the Olive Kettering Library before we went did not succeed at all. Artists did out of a need, you know, at different times and you know, in different countries. And, and the way they conceived it is what, you know, like I want you to try to, to figure out. be a different w wine somewhat. So what you should do is to remember this, keep your notes, and then in three years' time, see what has happened to it with more age, right? Get a color, people, people, gold. I feel like my my taste sensibilities have totally changed. That it, I, w I went through an alteration process. Um, and that, well, after, it's been six months now that I've been back in the United States, and I can definitely, um, um, my sensibility has definitely been deadened again, but I still have had three months of solid ex experience in um, uh, awakening enough of a, of a dimension of um, sensual and uh, experience that isn't common, uh, it's not a common American experience. What was the average alcohol? Between 10 and 10.5, there were, I don't think there were, 
was any chaperonization in 1969, very little indeed. Very little chaperonization, okay? I also saw what so, sort of wine snobs are. I mean, that was interesting, too. It got up to be a little bit obnoxious, just, I don't know, the snobbery of wine. You sort of wonder why, what gives these people the right to be so, you know, so snobby about it and to spend all this time and energy on making such a fine wine when, you know, there's lots of people who can't eat, have no food and stuff, and these people are just, I don't know. Is it cool? You should say something brilliant about this beautiful champagne. Well, I think it's the color. in my opinion, the quality we came into contact with was was uh, sort of a superficial nature. It was the things that we ate and the the things that we drank and maybe some of the things that came out of our mouth, but it wasn't the way we lived and it wasn't the attitude that we were, the attitude with which we were eating, drinking, singing, or perceiving. Um, I think that was the nature of the trip, the nature of movement nature of travel. You just can't open yourself up to a, a real aesthetic experience while uh, running around with everything you've got on your back. Knowing what you do now, do you think you would decide to go on the trip? If I had done it already, I wouldn't do it again, because it was such a hassle. But if I hadn't done it, and I had the option to do it again, knowing how it would come out, yeah, for sure I'd do it. Because it was, uh, along with being a hassle, it was an incredibly full experience.